welcome, welcome on this beautiful October afternoon. Thank you all for coming and not being out looking at leaves. <laughs> you can do that later. Um, I just want to mention cell phones. Please take them off, turn them off. And um, also, um, I want to thank the volunteers that provide us with coffee, tea, and goodies on the first Friday of every month. It's very, very welcome to have such a nice um, social gathering before we learn something. <laughs> and now, Sandy Baird will introduce our speaker. <coughs> okay, it's a um, great pleasure to introduce a friend of mine and a friend of all of uh, the people here and around the world, and that's Robin Lloyd. Robin Lloyd received her BA from Brandeis University in uh, I guess art history, is that correct, uh, Robin? We were talking about that this afternoon. She has an MA from Columbia. But more than all her official titles, Robin has always been a citizen diplomat in my mind and in the mind of many people in the world. She is the uh, an editor of Toward Freedom. Are you still the editor of Toward Freedom? Uh, uh, no, but she was. And uh, it was a, it's a journal that was founded by her family. And it is a journal devoted to politics and culture. She uh, is also a filmmaker, and Robin uh, made one of the best films probably that I've ever seen about Haiti and the Haitian Revolution. It's called Black Dawn, an animated film in which she used Haitian artists as the uh, people who painted the animated uh, figures and so forth for that film. She is also, she also did a film called uh, Be The Beijing Peace Train where she went to Beijing a number of years ago to uh, speak at the big women's conference in which women's rights were declared to be human rights, which is a subject that we're all thinking a lot about these days. Above all, Robin has brought an incredible perspective to bringing peace to the world. She has traveled all around the world and made international contacts, bringing a, a sort of a citizen's diplomatic view of the world that we all as citizens should be making peace in the world and not leave it up to our politicians. We all should be making peace. Anyway, it's a great pleasure to introduce Robin. And one more thing that I want to say about Robin. Um, I'm an attorney, she was a client of mine. She's the only client that I've ever had, as I said in seven days, who wanted to go to jail. And she served, I think three months, right? Um, and in a peace action that she was involved in at the School of the Americas in uh, Fort Benning, Georgia. So she spent three, not terribly difficult, but it's always difficult to be in jail. Okay, thank you. It's a great pleasure to introduce Robin. Oh, by the way, she wanted me to mention that this is her design. Robin is also an artist. Love Affair of the Century was done uh, uh, for the 100th anniversary of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. So, um, wow, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you. Thank you for, is this working? Oops, thank you for inviting me. Now will I be able to see my notes? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> okay. I give the signal and we see the next image, yeah. So um, four years ago, at the beginning of the 100th anniversary of World War I, I created what I call um, a performance piece. Oh, look at that. Related to my grandmother, my grandmother, who with many other women tried to stop World War I and helped to form the organization that endures to this day, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. I had this fine bust of Lola that I carried with me to The Hague in 2015, where a century earlier, she had gone with Jane Addams and others to try to talk sense into the warring leaders. I would ask her questions and she would answer, and then I would interpret her answers to the audience. So she was a, a, a live presence during this, these presentations. <laughs> um, 
And I got most of the information from her letters in her archives that I culled from the Schwimmer Lloyd collection, next picture, in the New York Public Library. I carried her to Colorado and even to Budapest, where a teacher at the George Soros Central European University wanted me to speak about Wilf and Lola's friend and fellow activist in Wilf, Hungarian pacifist Rosica Schwimmer. So researching for that piece, I learned so much about women's lives before suffrage and how they made things happen. I was astonished that in that day, before and during World War I, women were able to launch a political party, the Women's Peace Party, and organize boats to Europe across an ocean already rift with submarines, all this before obtaining the right to vote. What's, what chutzpah? In the process, oops, all right, I'll put that over there. In the process, I became aware of the split in the burgeoning feminist movement at that time between the pacifists and the suffragettes. So today, I'd like to, uh, <laughs> I'd like to trace those threads as they weave through the last century. Uh, this actually is an image from, um, from England, who, where women were going through the same trials and tribulations as we were. Um, these threads, as they weave through the last century, usually working together, but sometimes at odds. I'd like to start back before the Civil War, move quickly up to World War I, leading to the gaining of suffrage in 1920, whose anniversary, I want to point out, is less than two years away, and then touch on a few of the amazing developments in the last 100 years. So, historians agree that in the 18, oops, the one, one back, well, that's okay, but, yeah, there they are. That in the 1800s, Elizabeth Caton's, Katie Stanton and Susan B. Anthony were the two dynamic forces of the American suffrage movement. Uh, that's um, Stanton on the right. She's she's uh, short and plump, and and uh, and uh, Susan B. Anthony is tall and thin, and they just they really made a great pair for a number of decades in the suffrage movement. A galvanizing moment in the struggle took place at the world's anti-slavery convention in, the, uh, in London in 1840. Stanton attended that conference with her husband and with Lucretia Mott, a powerful anti-slavery speaker. They were upset uh, that women, including women who were official delegates, were sidelined to an upstairs gallery and not allowed to speak. Stanton later wrote how thoroughly humiliating it was to us. It reminded her of her childhood, where she felt discriminated against in church and school. I am so tired of that everlasting no, no, no. Uh, eight years later, um, she and a group of Quaker women mainly called the first women's gathering for suffrage, the Seneca Falls Convention in upstate New York to discuss the rights of women. One of the major outcomes of that convention was a simple but brilliant recap of the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women are created equal. They turned this revolutionary document into a truly feminist statement. It included a number of resolutions. The ninth was resolved, it is the duty of the women in this country to secure to themselves their sacred right to elective franchise. This was at that time a new thought to many men and to women. One newspaper called the convention, the most shocking and unnatural cartoon, the, excuse me, the most shocking and unnatural incident ever recorded in the history of women tree. 
cartoonist, as you can see, had a field day. But Elizabeth Cady Stanton knew what she was doing. Depend upon it, she said. This is the point of attack. For the next decade, the Declaration of Sentiments, as they called it, made ripples, um, even waves across America. But as the Civil War approached, reformers, including even women, felt that all efforts must be devoted to abolition, to freeing the slaves. And so in 1861, the women canceled their Women's Rights Convention, which had become an annual event by that time. This was the first of many occasions where the demand for women's equality was shunted aside for more important issues. The same thing happened during World War I and in the 1960s when male leaders of the anti-war movement would not make place for women in leadership, starting a whole decade of consciousness raising and women's separate activism. At the end of the Civil War, Stanton and Anthony hoped for a resurgence of activism for, for suffrage. The 13th Amendment had just abolished slavery. And when the 15th Amendment was considered, women thought that this was their chance, an opportunity for universal suffrage for African Americans and women alike. When Stanton saw the wording of the document, she became outraged at the way African American males were given priority over women. This is where racism in the women's movement began. Two disenfranchised groups were set against each other for recognition by the powerful white males who controlled the reins of power. Stanton wrote, as the celestial gate to civil rights is slowly moving on its hinges, it was unfair that women were supposed to stand aside and see Sambo walk into the kingdom first. So that was the way things were talked about in those days. Uh, unfortunately, post-Civil War politics over the 15th Amendment caused the women's movement to split apart. And I just want to say I obtained this wonderful book, Rosie's, oops, Rosie's and Radicals, which is, um, which tells the whole story from the Stan from Stanton and Anthony all the way up to suffrage, and it's available at uh, at Phoenix uh, Books. It's for young uh, young feminists. It's advertised, so it's sort of a it's a wonderful read. Uh, where was I? Um, the Celestial Gates. Yes, unfortunately, post Civil War politics over the 15th Amendment caused the women's movement to split apart. The irreconcilables simply opposed it because it did not also grant women the vote. They also split on strategy, one working on the state level that was considered realistic, and the other directing all its activity towards a national constitutional amendment. Nothing much happened on the national level on the next few decades, but women organized on the grassroots. This is an image from the Women's, Temperant, Women's Christian Temperance Union. Um, you know, alcoholism was rampant in, at that time, and basically what it meant for women was uh, domestic abuse. The guys getting drunk and coming home and and beating up the, the women and children. Uh, also, the YWCA was formed, and the American Association of University Women all got their start during this decade. Is there anyone here who's a member of that organization? Yes, OK. I see one or two hands there. Um, in the early decades of the 20th century, next. Um, it was Alice Paul who brought renewed energy into the suffrage struggle. She was a scholar and activist who learned and suffered with the radical Parkhurst sisters 
in England. Next. Uh, in prison in England, she refused to eat and experienced forced feeding two or three times a day, which was extremely painful. Here, a British cartoon quotes sat satirically the force feeder in chief. The jingle printed below reads, observe how we treat every case with the chivalrous tack of our race, how before we proceed to forcibly feed, we never omit to say grace. <laughs> Upon returning to the US, Alice Paul felt that success would only come with a loud and coordinated campaign to change the Constitution. Her first major spectacle was a parade down Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. In, um, in, in, in 1913. Organized by the National American Women Suffrage Association, it featured 8,000 marchers, including nine bands, four mounted brigades, 20 floats, and led by a woman on a magnificent white horse. It was planned to take place one day before President Wilson's inaugural march down the same avenue, uh, uh, during which no women were allowed to take part in that march. Can you believe how, how strange things were in those days? There were no aerial photos to show which was bigger, but... <laughs> But that, that wasn't the point. This demonstrated the power of the movement and made people think twice when they assumed that power only resided in men. In 1914, World War I began in Europe. People were horrified at the carnage as the German army raged, raged across Belgium and against the less well-prepared armies of France and England. The visit to America of a Hungarian woman, Rosica Schwimmer, galvanized women not previously active in the su su suffrage struggle to petition the president to keep the US out of the war and to offer mediation instead. Rosica Schwimmer met with Wilson, as did Jane Addams, the social work leader and head of Hull House who came from Chicago. It was much easier to visit presidents in those days. Uh, at that point, President Wilson seemed to hear them. He called the war uh, in Europe a cause with which we have nothing to do, whose causes cannot touch us. As alarm with the, with the continued violence of the war in Europe continued to grow, in early 1915, the leaders of the three women's movements, Alice Paul, the street activist for suffrage, Jane Addams, the peace activist, and Carrie Chapman Catt, who was head of the more conservative wing of the suffrage movement, met in Washington, D.C. to form the Women's Peace Party, declaring that peace and thus war is a women's issue. Believing that women's full participation in the political process was essential to ending global conflict, Members of the women's, oops, uh, back up one, I think. Uh, there's a, yeah, in fact, one more. There's a boat, isn't there a boat? There it is, the boat, the graphic, the women's peace boat. Um, believing that women's full partici participation in the political process was essential to ending global conflict, members of the Women's Peace Party declared themselves for both women's rights and world peace. Three months later, 47 women boarded a ship and crossed the Atlantic to meet with women from both sides of the war to see what they could do to stop the carnage. They hoped that diplomatic intervention could bring the war to a swift end and prevent additional loss of life. They resolved at that historic conference to be present at the time and place of whatever peace settlement would be signed and to urge for reconciliation instead of revenge. After the conference, they traveled to the belligerent and neutral countries both, urging a ceasefire and for the neutral countries to mediate a negotiated peace. 
Later that year, some took part in another peace boat financed by Henry Ford. I'm glad it avoided the submarines and that everyone made it back home alive as my grandmother brought my father and two of his sisters along at the invitation of Henry Ford. My father was seven years old at the time. He had a great, he and his sisters had a great time on board the boat, but the adults um, argued a lot. <laughs> Uh, things moved swiftly after that. In 1917, soon after winning re-election on the campaign slogan, He Kept Us Out of War, President Woodrow Wilson called on the U.S. Congress to authorize a war to end all wars. That's when the women's movement took different paths. Carrie Chapman Catt persuaded her group to support the war and tone down the demands for suffrage. Her position was, we don't want to alienate the men in Congress that we will depend on soon to vote for our cause. A very sort of realistic position, really. Um, <clears throat> there was, uh, there, during, um, once war was declared, there was only one mass parade in Washington during those years. Women walking in silence carrying banners, listing the names of suffrage supporters. I thought that was a, an amazing photograph. I mean, now I have a, a petition out there that you can sign, <coughs> and we can put it on the internet. We don't need to do it this way. <laughs> um, <coughs> maybe I have to drink something here. Um, <clears throat> Alice Paul, on the other hand, continued besieging the White House, demanding the franchise. Women picketed the gate to the White House six days a week from 10 to 5 for many months. This was the first time it had ever been done and that women had ever done it. <clears throat> In the summer of 1917, women started to be arrested, and again the women went on a hunger strike and were force-fed. The film... <laughs> the Iron Jaws, Jawed Angels documents that dramatic time. Even the anti-war activists were split. Jane Addams wanted to minimize the suffering caused by war and was willing to work in common action with the Allies, helping with conservation and distribution of food apart from military networks, hoping that it would lead to international cooperation. Others, such as my grandmother, felt that any effort to support the war effort was a denial of their pacifist principles. She sided with people like Roger Baldwin, who went on to form the American Civil Liberties Union, but who at that time created the American Union Against Militarism. Together they worked to organize opposition to conscription. So after the US entered the fray, Wilson, with the aid of the courts, turned on the pacifist activists and prosecuted opponents of the war who refused to fall in line. Under the Espionage and Sedition Acts, thousands were arrested for such crimes as giving speeches against the draft and calling the army a goddamned legalized murder machine. <laughs> I don't quite know whose quote that is, but it might have been uh, Eugene um, you, Debs. It might have been Eugene Debs. After the war, the takeover of the Russian Tsarist uh, Zar, regime by the Bolsheviks sparked a red scare in the U.S. led by Attorney General Mitchell Palmer. This was called the Palmer Raids. My grandmother was not uh, caught up in a raid, but she was listed on the spider's web created by the right-wing Lusk Report in 1924 that attempted to ferret out socialists and pacifists and charge them with communism. It was a grim time. So 
World War I altered the course of the 20th century, and not necessarily for the better, in my opinion. Jane Addams and Rosica Schwimmer and Lola Maverick Lloyd's prediction prior to the entry of the U.S. into the European War was vindicated. The U.S. entry foreclosed the possibility of a negotiated peace among belligerent powers that were exhausted from years mired in trench war warfare. In 1981, in excuse me, 1918, Armistice was declared on the 11th day of the 11th month at 11 a.m. That 100th anniversary will be coming up in less than two week, two months. I, two, a month and a half, whatever, yeah, in, in November. Yeah, uh, and I wonder how it will be commemorated. The terms of the Versailles Treaty that followed sowed the seeds of conflict for the next century. So one wonders if the US had not entered the war and instead offered mediation, is it possible that Hitler, Nazism, World War II, and the Holocaust could have been avoided? Did the war speed up the acceptance of suffrage? Investigating these questions could take many hours, but I hope that as the 100th anniversary of suffrage approaches, uh, education and enlightenment for everyone will make opportunities to hold discussions on the subject, on the, str on the struggle women waged to get the right to vote 100 years ago and its ramifications for today. I'd like to tell a not so heroic story about Vermont's role in that campaign. As you know, to ratify an amendment, it has to pass both houses of government by a two-thirds vote and then be ratified by three-quarters of the state legislators. The Vermont General Assembly in 1919 did not take up the 19th Amendment issue. By 1920, with only one more state needed to ratify the amendment, Vermont's governor, Percival Clement, an opponent of women's suffrage, resisted strong pressure within the state to call a special legislative session to consider ratification. Clement argued that the state could not afford the expense involved. With the 19th Amendment, when, when the 19th Amendment became the law of the land later in 1920, the Vermont General Assembly still had not ratified it. So women took advantage, Vermont women took immediate advantage of their federal vote. In the next gubernatorial election, Clement's candidate was defeated in the Republican primary by James Hartness, who had been a leading voice to ratify the 19th Amendment. According to estimates, Hartness captured about 75% of the 10,000 or more votes cast in the election by women. So this is another story of both Vermont's stubbornness and the impact caused, by almost, um, uh, caused almost immediately by the presence of women's votes in the ballot box. So what to say of the subsequent 98 years bringing us up to the Me Too movement? Many women fought hard to get an equal rights amendment passed. It was a one, it was a one sentence um, amendment that could fit on a banner. Equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the US or by any state on account of sex. But it failed to win support by three quarters of the states. So now, legally, you could say, there is really no legal equality between the sexes. Many nations have passed the CEDAW Convention, which is the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, which makes the e ERA, sort of makes our ERA global, but we don't uh, recognize CEDAW either here in the US. But many wonderful things have happened. 
the United Nations held four world, world conferences on women where women shared the suffering and challenges their sisters experienced due to misogyny, notions of male supremacy, and discrimination. I attended the last one in Beijing, China in 1995, and the film I made about it is out there, a couple of copies, $10. Um, <laughs> in, a day, in addition, women through the years fought for family planning and obtained the right to birth control and the right to abortion. Oops, no, one up or so. Uh, back, yeah, I, I, it should be there. Uh, it's just a, yeah, 1325. 1325, in the year 2000, the UN Security Council unanimously passed Security Council Resolution 1325, which reaffirms the important role that women play in conflict prevention, conflict resolution, and peace building. Women need to be at the peace table at the end of conflicts. Otherwise, it will just be men with guns glaring at other men with guns. Implementing this resolution has been a major focus of international wilf ever since the resolution was passed. So um, are we able to show Borge a, a video, the little video that I, uh, uh, it's, it's just, a, will that, when she clicks, will it, the moving picture? Okay. Uh, well, it, it will come up next, yeah. So I'd like to end by highlighting and honoring the two strands of the women's movement right now, okay, currently exemplified by the protests at the Kavanaugh candidacy for the Supreme Court, stressing the need for recognizing women's rights as human rights. In the elevator, the woman said, you are allowing someone who violated a young girl to sit on the Supreme Court. You are telling women that they don't matter. And then here is a short video of another kind of a protest by peace activist Media Benjamin, let's see if we can do that, um, who, who takes the confrontational tactics of Alice Paul uh, into the boardrooms of power. And this is a certain amazing short um, uh, 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 coverage of her uh, taking over a uh, a sort of conservative ballroom uh, boardroom and uh, and speaking out quite eloquent eloquently as she was carried away. So we're going to see if that will work. Uh, by the way, uh, Medea Benjamin was here in town just a week or so ago. I don't know whether some of you know her. She's the founder of Code Pick, Code Pink, and. Um, Code Pink was a name chosen because Bush established uh, a lot of uh, levels of um, alert uh, against terrorism or, um, or uh, disasters. It, it would be either yellow or purple or red, but they left out pink. And people felt, well, pink is too soft, pink is too womany. So, it was not a used in the official uh, list of, uh, of uh, alert uh, colors. So Medea and the other feminists said, well, we'll take pink. We will, call, we will uh, issue an alert for code pink. And they have been very active um, at disrupting events and uh, doing more than that. She has written several books. The latest when she was here last week was on Iran. And that is the um, subject that she is talking about, though she's not meant to be. There, she, there it's going to come. Let's see if you can get the sound. Yep, we'll be doing. Oops. Sorry, I should have, all right. 
Well, maybe we can um, we can show this when uh, we're able to get the sound on. But basically, that's uh, all I wanted to say. Uh, but I I do recommend this uh, this book, Roses and Radicals, and um, that we at this precise moment in history, uh, these issues and this history is very important to look back on and to realize that the struggle has been going on for over a century and it's not over yet. So thank you very much. Can you tell us what, what you would say? Well, this was a, um, a think tank, the Hudson think tank, that was discussing Iran's missiles and what a great threat they are to the United States and that, you know, we have to, I don't know what, because uh, the clip doesn't give too much uh, of his, his comments, but it was basically, you know, supporting the, the Trump position that uh, Iran is uh, a danger to the United States and to the world. And she was, um, she was um, arguing with that. She has been to Iran. I, I think I can hear a little bit of it. She, she says, um, look at what happened in Iraq. Uh, is that, do you want to? Could you say, you can hear it a little better than I can. Can you say what she's saying? Um, anyway, uh, you know, her courage to disrupt the status quo is what I really admire her for. I think she should be given the uh, the Alice Paul Award, Alice Paul being so um, courageous back in the day and to go to, to go to prison and to refuse to eat and to um, have to be force fed uh, three times a day. Um, I think uh, um, Medea Benjamin and the other women in Code Pink and the women in the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom too are getting um, uh, more and more ready to take uh, nonviolent action, I hope, as, as time goes on. So are there any uh, questions? Yeah. Uh, We're going to need a microphone. Oh. Maybe we don't need a microphone. Well, yeah, we do. <laughs> One thing I forgot to say when um, I was introducing Robin is Robin's family was the founder, one of the founders of the Women's International League of Peace and Freedom, and Robin maintains that organization today and has been on the board. And it's one of the oldest peace 
organizations in the world. I think that one of the things that was so important about World War I is that it actually uh, brought into being an international peace movement um, and an international anti-war movement. I think probably for the first time, isn't that correct, Robin? Mm -hmm. I mean, before that point, there had not been a terrific international consciousness that people have the sense or should have the sense to avoid war. And Robin's family was very active in that struggle, and she and her family were the founding people of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, which still exists today. Mm -hmm. And I, want, and I just wanted to bring that up because Robin is a real warrior for peace. <laughs> a, contra a contradiction, but a warrior without guns. <laughs> So we've, we've given up on the audio. Hi, I just wanted to, to make a comment that um, Alice Paul was not the only person who um, was force fed. Many of the suffragists in England had the same treatment and were jailed and force fed. Um, I'm specifically thinking of the Pankhursts, but the whole cadre of them were force fed. It wasn't just Alice Paul. Yes, yes, definitely. Somehow she's gotten most of the publicity, but the Pankhurst sister, sisters and, and their mother, I think, uh, were very active in trying to uh, stop World War I, though one of them then became a supporter of it. So there's a wonderful book written about that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But it's interesting when you see those two coming together. They're, they come apart at some points, but they come together that women naturally want to stop war, don't want their sons and fathers and brothers to be uh, out killing other mothers, fathers, and sons. And so there's that impetus to most of the movements in suffrage and in uh, equal rights of women to, to stress uh, peace as a part of the platform, whatever the group is. Yeah. Do you think that there is a unified um, unification of the different um, um, groups of women interested in peace and and um, Human rights. Human and, rights. Uh, Do you think it, there's a, a groundswell of one unified group? Well, I think there is a huge groundswell, yes, of, uh, of, of, of women everywhere. It's, the issues are multitudinous, and, uh, uh, and the, the, the way in which, um, you know, uh, Senators are um, uh, telling that the calls that have been coming into their uh, offices from women talking about their experience with assault or rape, it's as if a huge, uh, a terrible Pandora's box has been opened. It's not terrible, but one may be wonderful uh, eventually when, when this when people are able to really speak their grief and speak their pain and feel that they're being heard, uh, I think that will make uh, a very important change in in the U.S. But on the other hand, I don't know if if Kavanaugh is is uh, uh, selected for the Supreme Court. It will both bring deep dismay, but also probably great uh, uh, energy to commit to uh, to making long-range changes. Uh, after all, there will be other Supreme Court judges that will need to be um, elected. There are the midterm um, elections coming up when uh, I can't but believe that there will be a shift to the Democrats, and then after that, who knows what will happen depending on, I think, the energy of the outrage that has, has happened over the last couple of weeks. 
Don't you agree, or what do you think? Yeah, way back there. Well, it's great to hear your, Robin, your, your uh, synopsis and your history and the chronology and all of all of it. It just is so powerful through the years and how long it takes um, where is the thrust of the peace movement now as far as there's so many areas to be working on? Is the organized group identified any particular um, uh, plans or uh, uh, objectives? Uh, are you asking about WILF, Women's International League in particular, what is it focused on? Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Well, internationally, uh, it's focused on that 1325, the, uh, the Security Council resolution that women must be at, brought into the peace table. And this, this is meant on occasion, for example, a couple of years ago, there were hearings, uh, efforts to, uh, to uh, resolve the crisis in Syria and uh, Wilf worked to bring women activists and women community people to, from Syria to Geneva where it was going to take place and using 1325 to say these women have to be part of the, of the they have to be at the table, they have to be part of the uh, resolution that happens. And they were uh, stiff-armed despite the fact that that resolution is passed. So, you know, it's like with many thing, uh, things, a, a law is passed, but it doesn't matter in, in, until it's implemented, until people insist that it be implemented correctly. So, Wilf is working very hard in that area. We had our last um, Congress in Africa for the first time, uh, because this was an organization formed in 1915, so it was mainly European countries and the United States that were active in creating Women's International League, but now um, our executive director is, um, is encouraging uh, sections to form in India, and I think there's some 10 different sections, so that's really exciting. Now here in Burlington, where we have a branch, we uh, just sponsored the visit of the two Hibakusha to, uh, to Burlington, the atomic survivors of the uh, bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And uh, the woman, Mrs. Uh, Sasasota, is 86 years old, and the man was 78 years old, I think. I mean, and they... Um, they told very riveting stories about their experience, and we managed to get them into virtually all of the high schools in the area. To the whole, um, the whole student body came out to hear these women speak, and the, the woman and man speak. And it was a very. Uh, I attended the one at uh, University of Vermont, and it was so moving to see young people really concerned about issues of war and peace and about nuclear weapons that the idea of making small nuclear weapons that are more usable, that is one of the uh, proposals of President, President Trump, which I think would be disastrous because to think that they're more usable would mean that they might be used, you know, and uh, so uh, the students, they lined up, especially the girl students at UVM lined up one after the other to, to hug Mrs. Sasasoto. They were so moved by her, uh, her speech. So in fact, I'm meeting later tonight with the people who, other women in Wilf who planned that and we are hoping to have more uh, or to be in touch with students, what they made of all that, whether they're going to become more active themselves on these issues. So that's, that's been our main activity in WILF um, in, for the last, in, in the fall so far. Though we might be active in some sort of commemoration of Armistice Day. Watch for that.
What time is it? I wasn't keeping time at all. Oh. oh I guess uh, I do have a question. Do you really believe that if women were involved in peace processes that there would be less war? Uh, I mean, yes. ever, the, the opposing view is always, well, look at some of the women who have been in power, mm -hmm. Margaret mm -hmm. Thatcher, mm -hmm. uh, Golda Meir, and other women. Have they been that different? And do you really believe that if women were involved, it would be more, a more peaceful world? I, I think it's a matter of the critical mass of women. To, to not have one woman up there uh, with the whole burden of, uh, of the state on her, if she's the head of the state, um, that is, continues to be uh, male-dominated and militaristic. But if, uh, if they can, uh, and I think in some of the Scandinavian countries there is a um, close to majority of women in their uh, parliaments, and that this is um, a factor for them not to be not as uh, willing to enter into, uh, in, into uh, sort of NATO uh, experiments and NATO adventures uh, spreading, um, sp spreading uh, um, not, not so much war as spreading militaristic uh, uh, viewpoints in the Middle East. The expansion of NATO seems to me very um, uh, dangerous, really, and that uh, some of Trump's ideas, actually, I think are not uh, crazy. Uh, I mean, the trouble is he has the exact opposite view as well as a reasonable view. And, uh, you know, I mean, he suggested taking uh, our troops out of South Korea. That seems to me very reasonable, but that got immediately sidetracked and uh, ignored uh, so, uh, but even just to hear it being proposed was, was a surprise and was pleasant. Uh, do, do you have any contact with the uh, Vermont Council on World Affairs? Well, I attend some of their, their events and we, uh, we sponsored an event together, a woman coming through town who had been to Russia and had been on a tour of Russia and had, uh, you know, interesting things to say that were not uh, not sort of what we read in the newspapers, but more about how uh, Russians are uh, uh, working together and are uh, are supporting uh, peaceful initiatives and and uh, uh, many of them are prosperous actually and working as. Uh, small-time capitalists to build uh, build companies and, and all that. So that was one person that we co-sponsored. And I, I love to attend their events when I can. Do you? Are you a member? Yeah, they have them during the day. But they do bring a lot of visitors here. Yes, yes. That's, that's true. Did, did people hear the name of the group, the, uh, uh, the uh, Vermont Council on World Affairs? Yeah. Is uh, Wilpf doing anything about Senator Leahy bringing the nuclear F-35s to Burlington? Talk about local. Ah, what a good question. Uh, <laughs> The question is about the F-35 airplanes coming to the airport here, and oh, yes. Uh, I mean, we have been very involved in that uh, issue as well as along with uh, Save Our Skies Vermont, the, uh, that is against the uh, jet bombers coming here. I think once they get here, people will wake up and will say, how could we be allowing such an outrageous uh, vehicle to be in our airspace and destructive to our children's hearing, uh, uh, especially that, air, that uh, school, that the Chamberlain School, which is very close to the airport, 
and the impact on children where you, uh, you know, they take off and you have to not just c cover your ears, but it distracts children from even what they were thinking of, to think that learning can take place in an atmosphere like that. So why are we allowing that to happen? Why, why are our four leaders, the two, uh, two senators, our representative uh, Welch, and our mayor uh, going along with this? I mean, the, we had a vote in, uh, um, during, um, in, the, in the last uh, election, and 55% voted to not bring the air, airplanes here. The South Burlington and Winooski uh, City Council have also asked that the planes not come here. So we are being, like so many parts of the world, like South Korea, who the, the Koreans are, they've been asking for our, um, for our troops to leave and the bases to leave. And how about Okinawa, where a new, uh, a new base is being built uh, against the, um, against the wishes of the majority of the Okinawan people, we are suffering from this too, like a third world country. And I think it's, uh, I wish that we could have a, a more robust opposition. I know some people think, well, it's decided, there's nothing we can do about it. But I think there is a continual effort that we need to wage and that will grow as soon as they arrive and we see how horrible they are. Yeah? We're still working on it, I believe. We did last night, but we're still working on it. Working on, on, on stopping. Yeah. They have a suit against them going a on. Suit, a suit going on, yes. yeah. yeah. Uh, recently, an F-35 crashed in uh, North Carolina, I think. Uh, yeah. I and um, it was not in a super um, uh, populated area, like if it, if it crashed, crashed here. I mean, these planes are made of so many different medicals and, uh, um, metals and chemicals that uh, the fumes would be uh, highly toxic, and uh, you know, I, not 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 just from the fumes, but for uh, polluting the landscape. So I think uh, they have <coughs> they have not done enough um, testing to really uh <coughs> justify placing such a dangerous vehicle in our in our midst. Yes, apparently. I would guess that it, more than the pollution, the fact that we have to stockpile nuclear weapons here in Burlington mm -hmm. is alarming. Mm -hmm. I don't want to live next to a nuclear stockpile, and that is their task. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, they, the authorities claim that, well, we don't, we, don't <coughs> we don't intend to have the nuclear weapons here, but what are they saying when they say that? that I mean, because you're right, the plane is made to carry nuclear weapons, does that mean that they will train here using dummies of some sort and then they will fly somewhere and get the nuclear weapons put on the plane and keep going? I, uh -huh. I, I don't think that sounds like an efficient military strategy myself, but uh, they, they claim that there won't be nuclear uh, uh, bombs stationed here, but on the other hand, there's a lot of work going on out there, a lot of building, a lot of concrete being poured, and so we don't really know what is happening. Does anyone, does anyone have an idea what's happening? Yeah? There's a possibility that the nuclear machines will be used in the future. That, that, <laughs> that there's a chance that the what? It's, there's a possibility that they're going to be storing the nuclear arms in Plattsburgh. Oh, Plattsburgh. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I, 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 no, it's not, that's not much better, but Plattsburgh actually had wanted this over there. Uh -huh. They wanted oh, really? the, the uh -huh. F-35. Uh -huh. so. <laughs> well, in any case, either way, you know, in terms of us being the target of uh, the enemy, if that's what it comes to, uh, 
bombing Plattsburgh or bombing here is pretty devastating for both of us. Peter yeah. Welsh was on the radio just before I came to this meeting. Peter Welsh was on, the, uh, on being interviewed just before I came to the meeting, and the caller called in with the question about it, and he is totally sold on it. That none of the politicians are changing their mind about anything. I think if we all revolted and v voted them out, no matter what we're going to get in, who knows? Uh -huh. <laughs> But they, they just, they have no idea what it sounds like. I live in the flight path. I have enough noise from, from the F-19s. I go in the closet in the bathroom and close the doors, and, and if I'm on the telephone, people say to me, what is all that noise? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think you're right. We need to get people who will run against those who, who support this. In fact, there was talk of trying to get someone to run against Bernie. Um, and um, there is someone, I don't know who that person is yet, but uh, I think there is a person who's taken a position uh, in this election period against the F-35. There was the, the man who was running uh, for uh, James er er Erler, who uh, did not support the F-35. He ran in the primary, but he lost. I'd like yeah. to ask you what you think the future emphasis of the Me Too movement should be in the coming period. Ah, wow. Well, I think it's to run for office themselves uh, as much as possible, and I think many people are. Uh, the, uh, the demonstrations going on in Washington are starting to look like, you know, I mean, they're taking over uh, the Senate building and the and the Russell whatever it's called building and and just occupying it. It's I would think that that would be um, making the uh, politicians really think twice. And when they come home to see women uh, as active as they are. Um, have any of you taken part in the marches so far? There was one that came down to the democracy, uh, a statue on Main Street that um, was on Saturday, I think. There was another one as well. Um, so becoming active is, is what needs to happen and to run for office yourself. I th Maybe uh, there are other things. What do you think? I think the interpolitical concept in which you could defeat some of the main perpetrators <laughs> of this problem. Mm -hmm. Some of them on TV. Some of them what? Some of them have been on TV this morning giving their world view. And I think some of them should be defeated. Yeah. When you see them march out, the Republicans on the on the Judiciary Committee, and they all seem to be, I mean, not to, not to uh, be critical of age, I'm getting age, uh, aged myself, but <laughs> they all look as though they should have retired some time ago, and, <laughs> and, and that, uh, um, that they're, they're feeling very, they're speaking out in a way that they don't usually speak because they feel profoundly threatened, I think, for the first time. I mean, they, they're they part of the patriarchy, and this is challenging the patriarchy, and they, they, they're they sort of looking around and saying, what, what is happening here? But I think what's happening is going to get bigger and bigger uh, in the next few years. Thank you so, very, very much. Thank you. <laughs> yeah.